Hey everybody, thank you for tuning in to another episode of the Art of Intervention Project. And this is a resource for families and professionals to learn about the variety of ways to help your loved one through intervention. And today I get the privilege to interview Dr. Callie Estes, and I'll tell you more later on why that's a privilege for me. Uh, but Callie, how would you kind of introduce yourself? Who is Callie Estes? Oh geez, well, um, I am... I'm an addiction specialist that's been doing this 25 years, and I help people in all facets of addiction. But what I'm known for is my celebrity addiction clients. I work with high-end, high-profile CEOs, executives, the C-suite that nobody wants to address. Hey, you know, my boss is drinking, but if I approach him, I'll get fired. I work with those people. And of course, the crazy celebrities you see melting down on TV. I do some work with them. And the media has dubbed me the female Dr. Drew, which I don't know if that's true or not, but I kind of stuck. So there you good. go. That's a good, that's a good dubbing, <laughs> you know? Um, well, cool. Well, you and I met because you're the reason how I got started in the intervention world as I've gone through your academy and got trained. And, and since then I've just been, you know, ramping up to, as I grow my own business, but I was excited to interview you because as you're a leader in this kind of world as well, um, but how would you kind of describe like what is an intervention? An intervention is a stopgap of behavior. So it's basically taking somebody who's doing something and turning them around and sending them back the other direction. That's an intervention. And it could look many different ways. It could be stopping the bad behavior and putting somebody into detox or inpatient or PHP or IOP or harm reduction, which is stopping the bad behavior and saying, okay, this is out of control. How can we reduce the harm? Instead of drinking, you know, six beers, can you do five? Can you do four? So an intervention is just switching the behavior and turning it into a, a different direction that's more positive. I like that visual because it's not just this cut everything off. It can be, a, it's a process. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You know? And in the process, you have the loved one who has the addiction and then you have the family that has their own addictions and traumas along the way. And you work with both families and the individuals? We do, we do families, we do the individuals, and then we do coaching post the intervention. So it's not just grab the person, throw them in treatment, and then everybody has a meltdown. It's get them out of the situation and then work with the family so they understand what's happening. Because a lot of times the family thinks everything is the addict's fault. So the reason they drink is their fault, they need to go to treatment, they're gonna come back a changed person. But addiction is a family activity, like a board game. Everybody gets to play. And the problem is, the family isn't learning their new tools and coping mechanisms and what not to do. And I've seen families put the person in treatment and the person gets out and they go, okay, you've done so well. We're going to go to dinner. We're going to celebrate with a bottle of wine. And I'm going, what are you thinking? Because they don't know any better. So we do both the family, the client, we cover the whole gamut and make sure everybody knows what they're supposed to do. I had a little chuckle inside when you said board game, because I'd sit there and think of what would this actual board game look like? If we had the family of addiction board game, that would be an interesting one. Well, somebody tried to create one. Oh, so, they did. <laughs> yeah, it'll be interesting if she ever makes it. She she tried to put it together, and uh, we'll see. Okay, all right. Well, we'll roll <laughs> the dice on that one. But boom, boom, talk about gambling addiction. So, um, but how do you really know, like, if someone has an addiction, or is it just a recreational abuse? Here's the thing that I say: Is it affecting your work? Is it affecting your family life? And is it detrimental to what you're trying to do? So if you have goals and aspirations, is it stopping those? Are you missing college graduation? Are you missing weddings and uh, prom? If you're not, then maybe you're just a recreational user. But if you're finding that your use is taking more and more and more of your time, now you're starting to have a problem. Oh, I can't hear you. I think you muted yourself. Yeah, I, I muted myself. Well, I, this part, it's the thing with having kids at home and stuff. But hey, Zeke, I'm on an interview thing again. So chillax. <laughs> all right. Um, yeah, I mean, an addiction comes in all different levels, right? But like I said, if it's, if it's really causing a problem, and I, and I always feel like if people are asking, like, do you think I have an addiction? Mm -hmm. Chances are you probably have maybe an addiction to something if you're, if you're wondering. Here's what I say. I think everybody has a vice to something. And a lot of people say, well, I'm not an addict. And I'll say, okay, do you eat sugar? And they'll say, well, yeah, okay, quit sugar. And they'll go, oh, I can do that, I can do that, great. I want you to quit for two weeks and keep a food mood journal. 
And then they'll come back to me on day three and they're like, I have a headache. I'm grumpy. I hate you. This sucks. I don't want to do it. And I'm like, well, congratulations. You're addicted to sugar. You're detoxing. And a lot of people say, oh, you know, well, I, I don't understand why people use heroin or alcohol. And when I give them the sugar exercise, they stop and they say, wow, now I understand what it's like to stop something because I need it or I want it. Um, I had a woman that was addicted to uh, social media and Amazon Prime. And she every night from eight o'clock to nine o'clock, she's shopping. And she's buying stuff like toilet paper and tissues. And she's like, well, it's stuff I need. And I'm thinking, you don't need 300 boxes of tissues. <laughs> right. That's an addiction to Amazon Prime. Then let's have a conversation about it. So everybody's addiction can be different. It's just, if it's starting to get into your lifestyle and become a problem, um, then that's when we need to stop it. Yeah, definitely. As, yeah, I joke about the toilet paper thing because we're in this COVID-19 pandemic now. And so people are fear, fear shopping in those regards. Um, but yeah, so addiction has many faces to it. And then as we, we're going to get into the actual style of intervention that you train mm -hmm. people on and that you do. Um, but how does, so when people are moving into the world of recovery, like what does recovery look like in your, in your view of framework? So sober and recovery are two different things. Sober basically means you don't use certain mood altering substances. Recovery means you've changed your behavior. That's what it means. So for, for what my clients do, some of them aren't 100% abstinent, but they've changed their behavior. Maybe now they're using less substances or gambling less or, you know, screaming at their wife less. That's recovery. They're moving into that. So I know a lot of people say, well, recovery means you're totally sober. You go to meetings, you do all this stuff. Well, that's subjective. Not everybody is totally sober and you don't have to be. If you can go out and have a glass of wine with dinner and you're totally fine and that doesn't lead to cocaine and hookers and disappearing for five days, you're okay. You know, if that was your addiction before. So everybody is different. And I take each case individually and ask them, what's your goal? What do you want to do? And then I meet the client right where they are and then help them get from point A to point B. Yeah. So you probably see other things pop up along the way as they get rid of this substance and other things rear its ugly head. So how do you address those situations with them? So what I tell, I tell a person is if you're truly an addict, you're going to be addicted to something else once we take away the first thing. For most people that have alcohol as a problem, sugar is their go-to. Heroin, sugar is the go-to. That's why you see people say, you know, I got sober and I got fat. Well, because you're using food now as your addictive substance. So I let them know something's going to happen. It might be gambling. It might be sex. It might be internet. It might be food. So as we start the process, I want to know what you're gravitating towards because we want to address that because we don't want that to become your next addiction. And it could be exercise. I mean, there's people that go, I'm totally sober, but they're running tough mutters and they're flying around and missing their daughter's graduation because they're in this Spartan race and that Spartan race. They're addicted to the medals and the fame. And that's because they hung up, you know, their drinking shoes. But we have to address all of that because it gets out of control. Cool. So why do you care to help people? What's your, what's your passion for it? Where's it come from? Two things. I've always been in service and I've always enjoyed that and helping people, even if it was, I was in fitness and I was in um, addiction. I've been doing this for 26 years now, this year. But my husband also is a recovering addict and he had a heroin addiction as I was building my practice. And you know the story where, you know, he was using heroin while I'm building my practice and it was really rough. And one of my competitors found out and put a big thing on Facebook of how could I be effective and help people if my husband's still a junkie. And when my husband got sober, we wrote a book and it's a bestseller called I Married a Junkie. And it's all about me building my practice and helping people while my husband's using heroin and trying to tear the business apart. So I wanted that to work and I wanted him to be well. And I wanted at the same time to train people, which is why I got into training because I'm one person. I can only help so many people. But if I can train people, there can be an army of people helping other people out there, not just me. Because at one point, it was just me. And I said, how can I make this more beneficial to everybody and affordable? Because when I started the Addictions Academy, it was not affordable. If you wanted to be an interventionist, it was a $10,000 buy-in. And I thought to myself, well, what if you want to be an interventionist, but you don't have 10 grand? No payment plan. Like, that's all you, you know, the top people, that's what they charge. And I thought well, why don't I charge less and show people how to do this? And that's why I started the Addictions Academy because I wanted more people to be able to access the training to help more people. 
Cool. Yeah. So let's talk about what is, what can people expect when they call and say, I need an intervention from the phone call to like the next couple steps in the process? So we're a little bit different. We're going to ask about 20 minutes of questions to make sure the client, we can help. That's the first thing. We don't take anybody we cannot help. And if we can't, we're going to refer you to somebody who can help you. So we have enough resources to say, we're not the right fit. Let me, you know, refer you out. From there, we sit down with the family. It's a two week process and it's by phone and Skype like this. And we're asking questions about the loved one. We're asking, is there a drug test, mental health? We're getting all this out of the way. And then we give assignments to the client, which is the family. They have certain assignments. They're going to pack a trash bag in a suitcase. And this is my signature move that I use when we're doing the intervention. It's not a question at the end. If you watch the show intervention, um, I don't know if you've interviewed Ken Seeley yet, but Ken Seeley does a thing at the end of intervention and his team, Candy and them, and they say, will you accept this gift of treatment? We don't do that because the addict doesn't go, that's not a gift. Treatment is not a gift. It's a punishment. And for me, that's a harder intervention. So we have a, a trash bag in a suitcase. And when they're in the intervention, we give them an option. You could be homeless trash bag or suitcase treatment. We let the addict decide what they want to do. So our intervention is putting the addict more in the seat of control because that's where they want to be and giving them options. So the family in that two-week lead up is changing the locks and we're getting the trash bag suitcase and we're prepping where they're going to go. And I give them three options or more and let them vet the different places and come back and say, this is the best fit. So we're prepped for the intervention. That's the lead up to the actual intervention. And when we come in, one of our signatures is we do it in less than five hours because we've done so much homework pre, we know the client, we know what we're doing, we know what the, you know, the, the closing techniques are, we know what the um, butts are gonna be, but I can't because, but I can't, we know <laughs> that, we're ready to go. And when the client walks in the front door, it's a five hour or less intervention. And here are your options. What do you want to do? And we give the client the buying power. So the addict has the buying power of, I can go take my, you know, my suitcase and go to treatment, or I can take my trash bag and drag it down the street and hopefully get into the Salvation Army. And usually they go to treatment because they're able to make a decision and it's not a forced entry that way. What are some of the big butt questions you hear from the loved one that's that we're trying to help? But I have to go to work, even though I've missed more days this month than I have all year. Uh, we hear that. But I don't have vacation. But I have kids. But I have a spouse. Those are the main ones. So before the person gets there, we have all the information we need, whether they have an EAP or FMLA. Can they get vacation? Who's going to take the kids? We even, and this is a, another signature thing I do, is if, if kids is going to be the stopping point, we have somebody prepare a day-to-day, hour-by-hour schedule for 30 days. So they know that child number one, Becky, is gonna be in school, you know, mom's gonna make, grandma's gonna make pancakes for breakfast. Then she's gonna drop her off at school, she's gonna be in school, she's gonna pick her up, she's gonna take her to cheerleading, dinner's gonna be pot roast, and then it's homework, and then it's bath at eight, bed at nine. We have 30 days of that. So when the person goes, well, I'm not going to treatment because I have kids and I have to watch my kids, we can say, take a look at the schedule. These people, these family members are going to take care of your kids better than you right now. Mm. And that shuts down the, I have kids. I can't go real fast. Cause it's like, uh Oh, they're better parents than me. Well, yeah, we're playing. We're ready to rock and roll. Off you go. No more objection there. So lots of, lots of preparation and the art of an intervention is the ability to overcome objections by the loved one. What objections do you hear from the family though of like, well, gosh, if we do this thing, uh, he's never going to talk to us again. You hear that a lot. And here's what I say. Yes, he will. He's going to be mad, but let him be mad at a specific person. So when we set up the intervention, for me, it's very different than any other intervention you're going to see. We use Claudia Black's style of personalities, and we place people in the room so it flows naturally. So that addict is going to be pissed either way. We want them pissed at the person in their family they're normally pissed at. There's always one person, like, I don't like that person. That's the person they're going to be sitting across from. And that's the person that's going to just push them just enough that they can get all their energy directed and anger towards that person. And then we remove them. Now we've got the energy and anger off the table. Now we can talk about solution. So there's a specific art to setting it up. I don't believe in just throwing people on a sofa and hoping it works. I psychologically pick the people in the room and set them specifically 
so that the energy flows. Because in psychology, energy is important. And our type of model is called the RAD model, R-A-A-D, and it's specific to getting the client to do what you want psychologically. So there's some NLP, there's some motivational interviewing, there's some sales training, there's some positive psychology, and all the intervention, all the interventionists that get trained under me understand that. So it's the flow of the intervention should be quicker and it should be seamless, as opposed to having to battle the consistent buts because everything is prepped ahead of time and then the way you sit everybody makes it flow real nice. Okay. Is RAD, does that stand for an acronym of anything? Yes, so the first one is read the client. You have to be able to read your client. A lot of people walk into a room, they don't read the client, they start talking. And I say, if you're talking, you're losing. You have to think of this like a car sale. When you walk in to buy a car, the car salesman asks you two questions. What do you want? What can you afford, right? He's already assessed what you can afford by what you're wearing. And I go in usually in workout clothes and no makeup just for fun, because I always get the rookie salesperson and then I can negotiate better. Uh -huh. So you have to read your client. You have to assess the situation. A lot of people don't assess the situation. They say, okay, well, every family's the same. Well, that's not true. My family is more crazy town than anybody. I've got bipolar and borderline in my family. If I do an intervention in my family, it's gonna be intense. So you have to know that before you get into the situation. And that's where a lot of interventionists fail. They get into the room and they just start talking and they just start babbling. And it's like 20 minutes of babble. You can't do that. You're buying a car and the car person's just talking and you wanna know, does it have heated seats? And he's talking about you know this and that and the other. You're gonna stop him and say, all I wanna know is does it have heated seats, right? You get irritated. So that's where interventions fail as well. So we have to read the client, we have to assess the situation, we have to anticipate the needs of the client. People don't anticipate the client. They don't anticipate what's going to happen. So in our pre-workup of this two-week lead-up, what we do is we ask specific questions about the client. Are they violent? What do they like? I wanna know as much personality as I can we hawk their Facebook, their Instagram, their TikTok. We know about the client before we walk in the door and we dress to meet the client. I don't dress to meet the family. So when you look at some of these interventionists, they come in in suits and they're all dressed up and that's a position of power. If I'm doing an intervention on an 18 year old boy, I'm gonna come in a hoodie with my hoodie up. I'm gonna walk in, I'm gonna go suck with my head, just like he does. And he's gonna go, huh, what's that, right? That's what you wanna do. You wanna be able to get to the client. And the last one is direct the flow. You wanna be able to direct it like a movie, a movie set. You're in control. People lose control of the room and don't know how to get it back. You have to have a commanding presence, you have to be authoritative, and they have to understand you are in a position that you understand what you're doing. If you don't command a presence, they're gonna run that room all over you. You have to be able to stop the crazy family because there's always one, the codependent enabler is gonna to try to throw a wrench into your intervention and you have to be able to say, hang on, hang on, I got this. You hired me. Let me handle this. Um, to give you an example, I had a, a woman in New Jersey. I was doing the intervention and everything we were doing, she kept trying to ruin. I said, but this, but this, but this. And finally I said to her, I think you need to wait outside. That's probably going to be the best course of action is you go outside. And she goes, I paid for this. I want to be here. And I said, well, you're ruining my intervention. And guess what? It's going to fail and you're going to have wasted your money and it's going to be your fault when your son dies. And she just looked at me. And I said, please wait in the hallway. Because sometimes, even if they have the best intentions, the family can turn that intervention sideways and they need to be in the hallway. And getting her out of the room was the best thing I could do because he went to treatment 10 minutes later. He looked at me and he goes, you did something no one's ever done. I said, what? He goes, you got my mom to listen. She doesn't listen. Mm. And I said, oh, well, that's probably why you use drugs. No one listens to you. And he looked at me and he goes, you have no idea. So it was just sitting there talking to the client that got him to realize I cared and I was another person who understood. That's the RAD model. All right, cool. Yeah. <laughs> and people, like I said, the family understands that when they come into this journey, that you're the, you're the director of all this and mm -hmm. you have the power to say, hey, you need to leave or you can stay or kind of all those things. What does it look like sometimes? Like, have you ever had to kick the entire family out of an intervention? Yes. I had, and this is a crazy story for you. I had mom and dad who were divorced. So dad was 50-ish, remarried to a 21-year-old, brought her to the intervention. Mom was 45-ish, 
um, dating a 21 year old brought him to the intervention. Mm. And the poor kid was older than both of the girlfriend and, and step parents. So that was an odd situation. A mom and dad are sitting across from each other, just arguing the entire time. And their respective significant others are sitting there doing this. Because first of all, they're 21, so they're on their phone. And second of all, they don't care what's going on. They're being drugged there as a showpiece. You know, this is my arm candy for the other one. And the poor kid's just sitting there like this with his head in his hands. And I just looked at him and I thought, wow, mm. what a mess. And I just threw out the whole family. And I'm sitting across from him. And I just looked at him and I went, what and i don't know if i can curse on here but i said what a you know what a poop show basically and he just looked at me and he went and just shook his head and i said like, i gotta get you out of this situation i don't know how you're dealing with these people mm. and i had that they're in the hallway screaming at each other and we can hear them screaming you know it's your fault he uses drugs and it's your fault you're a bad parent you slept around and i said let's go so i got him into treatment basically because the family imploded so Sure, it was a bad thing, but for an intervention, it was a good thing because I took the bad thing to my advantage. And I didn't sit there and try to get the family to keep talking and read love letters. I just thought, nope, in the hallway you go, let me do my work without you because this is not going to go a good direction. Yeah, I can imagine. You never know. None of them are the same. You never know what you're going to get. And you mentioned love letters. So do you use letter? You hear a lot about the letter writing process. Do you use that in your model? I asked the family to write a love letter and email it to me ahead of time. And I take a big black magic marker and I cross out anything that shouldn't be read because sometimes families think this is the venting process. And I had one dad write a 17 page love letter. By the time I was done crossing it off, the only thing he was allowed to say was dear Becky, I love you. Love dad. Because mm -hmm. all of it was you did this and you did this and you did this and this is wrong. And, and I said, this is not the time or place for that. So love letters can be good. They can be powerful if written correctly. They can also be detrimental when you get that person that thinks this is the time where I tell you what a horrible person you are because I need to talk to you and you're sitting here and I can finally say that with a mediator. And this is not the time or place for that. Okay, yeah. And so we come to the end of the intervention day. Here we are, mm -hmm. loved ones choosing to go direction A, which might be going to treatment or not. Mm -hmm. So in both those scenarios, which one do you want to answer first? They go to treatment, what do you do? Or they don't go to treatment, what do you do? So I'll start with they don't go to treatment. So if they don't go to treatment, um, what I try to do is towards the end of the five hour window, I'll say, listen, I have a plane flight out at five o'clock and I'm leaving with or without you. And if you're not going, you're going to be out. And if you don't leave, we'll just call the police because your stuff is in a trash bag and we'll put it by the curb anyway. So what do you want to do? That usually puts pressure on them. Now they're, because I'm gathering my things and I'm getting ready to go. So they usually want to go. If they choose not to go, what I do is I hand them my business card and I say, call me. So 1-800 number, wherever you are, I will send someone to come get you when you're ready. You're going to get tired out there. You're going to run out of money. You're going to couch surf and you're going to have other people's drugs until they throw you out. What's going to happen is you're going to be homeless. And when you go to the Salvation Army, they're going to steal your stuff. So that's the bottom line. And when that happens, call me. If I get somebody who says, I don't want your business card and they throw it at me, I put a bunch of business cards in a little plastic baggie under the mat in the front door. And I say, don't have to, you don't have to ask mom and dad. You don't have to knock on the door. Just stop by and pick them up. They're in a plastic baggie in case they get wet. Take them with you and just call me when you're ready. So that's that. If they're going to go, it's great. Grab that suitcase, grab that trash bag, pack what you want in it. Let's go. We'll string through whatever drive through you want, whatever snacks you want. And let's get, let's get going because we're running out of time. Whatever that plane flight is, the time we have to be there, and then off we go. Once we leave, so the interventionist and the client leave, the family has a debriefing with a secondary family coach immediately. Okay. So they know as soon as we leave, that family coach is on a Skype call or a phone call, covering the intervention, covering any questions, and basically bringing the energy down because the family is distraught, especially the enabler. You just took their addiction. So the client's addicted to drugs and alcohol, the enabler codependent, which is usually mom or dad, is addicted to the client. So now I took their drug away. So they're, they're detoxing and they're spinning and what if they don't eat? And what if my, you know, if they don't shower? Did they have enough clean underwear? And all that's happening. So they have a debriefing with the coach. They then have their family coach with the family. They talk every day, but the person is in treatment. That's part of our intervention. And we want that to happen because we want changes from the family. So by the time the client comes home from treatment, the family has had enough coaching. They know what to do, what not to do, what not to say, and what to say. 
and they've worked through some of their animosity and their anger and their resentment. So that's our process, which is a 30 day process. Okay. And recovery or treatment, I guess, let's just say is not just a 30 day plan, right? So yeah. what does that look like after care for people? Typically, what do you recommend for families and the individual? So we do either sober companions. We have sober companions all around the world that can come live with the client for any number of days and help them stay sober, or we can do recovery coaching and therapy. We have licensed therapists in every state. We also have recovery coaches all around the world that can work by phone and Skype and they get on with the client. They talk about coping mechanisms and triggers and staying sober and coach them to get to that level. All right. Perfect. Yeah. Sounds like the rolling out plan. So let's, so that we understand now the RAD model, kind of how you help people, but what's your personal story? Like how did you get into the recovery world? And I was addicted to foods. I'm a food addict primarily, and I wanted to be an FBI agent. And when I was in college, I interviewed with a female agent and she said, you're going to be an undercover narcotics agent and fetch coffee. And I said, that's not what I want to do. And she goes, well, then you don't want to be an FBI agent in the nineties. We hadn't, you know, we hadn't seen CSI. Um, Miami and all that criminal minds had not come out. So I said, okay. And I went and did my internship at a prison. I was the first female at SCI Rockview to do an internship. And I wanted to work with the serial killers, the crazy guys. And the warden said, what are you crazy? And put me with the drug addicts. And of course I said, this is boring. And then I realized two things. First of all, I identified with these people. And second of all, I was really good at this because my um, mentor was ex-CIA. So he taught me body language and he taught me how to read the cues without saying a word. So I started learning the tricks. And then when I left college, um, I realized I was a food addict and I ended up addicted to diet pills and speed and whatnot. And when I got it under control, I thought, this is what I want to do. I want to help people who have these issues with food and drugs and other things because I'm really good at it and I like to see them succeed. So that's how I started which then led into uh, the addictions coach, which is you know the celebrity addiction um, treatment for CEOs and such, and then creating the academy to help other people. All right, so speaking to families now, thanks for sharing a little bit of your story, that are sitting on the fence right now, and they're thinking, man, I really wanna call, but I'm afraid to call because you know, I know Fred or Susie or Kim or whomever, they're just gonna hate me. What advice would you give them to pick up the phone and what questions should they ask when they call to get an interventionist? Okay, so call first because it's free. Discovery calls are free. And that means call and just get information. That's not gonna hurt you. The questions you wanna ask are this. What type of intervention do you have? There's invitational and Johnson model. So invitational is you invite the client. Johnson is surprise. When I'm working with the C-suite, C-level executives or celebrities, we do an invitational model. We invite them into the process because if you don't, they're not gonna go. Decision makers are always invited. Um, somebody who's financially dependent should be a surprise model. So your 18 year old son who lives at home, who doesn't have a job, who smokes weed and plays Xbox, that's a surprise intervention because you pay all of his bills. If you shut off his phone, he's going to treatment. And that's one of the tricks we do in the intervention. We actually shut the phone off in the intervention and then the anger goes through the roof, which is really interesting. But my suggestion is just call. Ask what style of intervention you have. Ask the length of the process. Ask how people sit where they sit, what type of model they use. And basically your goal is to figure out the right person for your loved one. Not everybody's a good fit for you. You wanna interview interventionists, you want to talk to them. When we have a family that calls in, we send them three interventionists by Skype to talk to, to see who do they like to work with? Who do they feel would be the best fit for their loved one? Not everybody's the right fit. I'm very commanding, I walk in, I run that room. But when I do that, I'm usually working with uh, clients that are stubborn, clients that are egotistical and narcissistic. So I'm very good at what I do. I'm not warm and fuzzy. So if you have somebody who has lots of trauma, I'm not the right fit, but I have people that are. So the, the family should interview at least three different people. Get, get, a fit, get a feel for who you like, find out their style, find out their process, ask what needs to be done, what, how long does it take, and then go from there. Which is one of the reasons why I did the Art of Intervention Project was to say, hey, there are different ways, different types, different personalities. They can come watch this and say, hey, I like Callie. I like her presence. I like what she does. She'd be a great fit for, you know, whatever we have going on or not. And then they can, it's like you said, shopping and making sure you have the right fit. So talking to interventionists that are new 
in the field right now that are watching this also because they want to get better at what they do. How do you encourage them to grow as an interventionist? Cross train. We have a lot of students that take my program and Judy Landau's program, Arise. They take both because her model is completely different than mine. So is Hightowers. So we have people that take Hightowers or Ken Seeley's BRI program. They're vastly different. The more training you can get, the better the interventionist you're going to be because you're getting tools from each one of us. And if you just have one model and say, this is all I'm going to do, it's not going to work for every client. You need to be able to pivot and you need to be able to switch things up as the clients change. So the more training you can get, the better you're going to be at what you do. I always call the interventionist the quarterback on game day, right? Because you're calling audibles. And if you only have one play in your playbook, you're going to look kind of foolish when you're standing there in front of the family. And we're dealing with life and death. We're dealing with longevity. You know, we, we have magical tricks that can work and ways to get around certain things to get them on the right track. And the last part of like the art of intervention is transformation. And so when you think of the word a transformed life, what does that look like as someone in recovery? That's an awesome question. So my newest book is called Unpause Your Life, The Seven Keys to Tap Into the Wealth Inside You. And it's all about what's next. So you have the people that go, they get treatment or they get sober, they get recovered. And then they sit there and they go, now what? Because it's one day at a time. Well, if it's one day at a time, you're never going to get a job. You're never going to have any goals. You're never going to have a bucket list because you're only focused on the now. So I say there's a couple different things. First of all, you have to find your purpose in life. You have to find your passion. You have to find your tribe. You have to make peace with money because I know a lot of people in early recovery, they're afraid to ask for what they're worth because they say, I don't want to ask for money. I don't want to take money. But you have to do that to be able to pay the bank bill and the rent bill and the mortgage and the car. You have to do it. And then, of course, handling your limiting beliefs. People have all these limiting beliefs of what they should do, what they could do, and what they're doing. So a lot of people you know, go through this process and they come out and they say, you know, I'm an accountant. I don't want to be an accountant. I want to be a counselor. Great, let's do it. Well, I'm not going to make any money. Well, maybe you might be a really good counselor making a lot of money. So let's defeat the limiting beliefs and then let's get a roadmap and then let's jump and do it. That's the next process. That's the transformation from now we're sober and we've been through the, the process and we're recovered, but now what? Now we have to have life. We have to do something with your life. You can't just say, oh, you know, I'm a recovering addict. Great, what are you doing? What do you mean, what am I doing? What are you doing with your life? You know, you got that down. Let's do something now. So that's transformation. Yeah, coaching them forward and finding that purpose because without purpose, we just, we just, especially like now and in, in today's day and age, we have this COVID-19 pandemic, right? And people are just, I think, really exploring a lot of that. You know, they're sitting at home drinking like crazy. Family doesn't know what to do with them, right? Because they're just like, well, we can't kick them out because there's nowhere to go. And so we have a unique situation in our world, I think, like right now. But I think a lot of people are exploring that question of like, what is my purpose, especially fearing losing a business or losing a loved one due to addictions for sure. Oh yeah, absolutely. And there's so many different things you can do. I actually started a course for therapists to go online because therapists are panicking. They're used to face to face. I've been virtual for almost 10 years now. And I'm like, why are you guys not virtual? What do you mean? Telehealth. Everybody's telehealth. If I need to go see a doctor, I don't go to the doctor. I call telehealth and I say, Hey, this is what I need. You know, I have, a, I have an ear infection. I think can I get an antibiotic? Sure. Okay, great. Now you have a, an antibiotic. I don't have to go to the doctor, urgent med or what have you. And I'm teaching therapists how to do that. And they're shocked. They're like, what do you mean you're online? I've been online forever. You know, I have a home office. I don't bring clients to my home office. This is how we, how we talk. And it's great. Yeah. So do you coach people? I was talking to an interventionist recently and they were actually getting ready to, ready to do their first virtual intervention with a family because uh -huh. of what's going on right now. Uh -huh. Do you actually coach a family? to just walk them through the process so they could do it on their own? Absolutely. I've been doing that for 10 years too. So I'll give you an example. I had a family in Massachusetts, such a fun family, and they didn't want to pay for the whole intervention. They had limited funds. I said, all I want you to do is put me on the Skype. Uh, we actually use GoToMeeting on the computer and just sit me on a chair. And they said, what? I said, just sit me on the chair. So they did. And I was in the room and I said, this is what we're going to do. And I'm coaching the family. They're listening. They're following. They're reading their letters. The loved ones listening. And the whole process was about an hour and a half and he went to treatment and the family said that was so easy. And I said, it's because if you do the lead up, right, if you do the time right with the family, that intervention will go so smooth that you don't even need to be there in person. 
So was that an invitational type model or how did they set that up to get you? I mean, you're on the couch or the chair, but how do they get the loved one home? Well, and actually, that was a surprise. They invited him over for dinner with his girlfriend and his girlfriend was, was in on it and she brought him over and they're sitting there. And of course he was mad. He's like, I don't want to be here. What is this? What's going on? And, you know, they just said, well, we have some concerns. We want to talk to you. And here we are. And we're going to have dinner and blah, blah. And, you know, all he was concerned with was what was for dinner. So it was all about, well, we're going to have dinner in an hour. You know, we have, we're, we're going to make dinner, but we want to talk to you first and, and talk about some of these issues. And we just kind of all did the intervention. And it was very, it was seamless because of the setup. We made sure that this client would be a good fit for this model. Now, not every client's a good fit for this model. You know, the, the client could get mad and slam the computer down and break it. Okay, that could have happened, sure. But we want to make sure that, that your loved one is a good fit for this type of consultation. So what did they have for dinner? Steak and potatoes. <laughs> there you go. And they, they sent you one via, via mail. Yeah, <laughs> um, which is cool. Well, you're definitely, I like your flexibility, your creativity, and you're helping tons of people out there. Is there any words of advice or encouragement you want to give anyone as we kind of wrap up today? Sure. If you think you need an intervention, always call. Always call and ask. Uh, definitely, we could at least talk to you and, and see if it's something you need. It may not be. It may be something we could walk you through. And if you are a student or a person who says, I want to learn how to help, check out theaddictionsacademy.com or Google me, Cali Estes, or give us a call and we can help you get into the classes and teach you how to do what we're doing. Cool. So what's your phone? What's the phone number to the Academy? 1-800-706-0318 extension two. And one of our admissions uh, coaches will be able to take your call. There you go. Well, thank you for your time, Dr. Callie Estes. I appreciate you and enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thank you. And thanks for having me. You got it.